Welcome to Biodiversity in the West, an EcoWest.org presentation. EcoWest's mission is to inform and advance conservation in the American West by analyzing, visualizing, and sharing data on environmental trends. This is one of six presentations that illustrate key environmental metrics. Libraries for each topic contain additional slides. You can download these presentations at ecowest.org. Let's begin with a summary of the presentation. Biological diversity in the American West is impressive in terms of the number of native species and the sheer variety of ecosystems in just one part of the continent. It varies widely across the region and across types of species, but tends to be concentrated in geographic hotspots many of which are imperiled. It is increasingly threatened by habitat loss, invasive species, and climate change, but overhunting and collecting are less of a concern today. It's undergoing major changes as warming temperatures and altered precipitation patterns are causing rain shifts for plants and animals. It's also biased on the policy level toward protecting charismatic megafauna and species listed under the Endangered Species Act. This presentation is divided into four sections. First, we have a discussion of the basics of biodiversity. Then we focus on the various biomes and ecoregions that are found in the West. Next, we move to species diversity and extinctions. Finally, we discuss imperiled species on the IUCN's Red List and those that are protected by the Endangered Species Act. Let's begin by discussing some of the basics of biodiversity. What explains why one part of the West has one set of species and another area close by has such a different suite of plants and animals? The biological diversity of a particular place depends on many factors, but there are some basic building blocks that influence which species live where. The basic geography of a place, its latitude, its elevation above sea level, its distance from the ocean, plays a huge role in determining what the climate will be like. The temperature and precipitation patterns, even the humidity and rate of evaporation, establish critical parameters for species. These forces in combination explain why certain types of soils, vegetation, and animals are found in some places, but not others. Temperature and precipitation play critical roles in determining the distribution of plant communities around the globe. Plant distributions, in turn, determine which types of animals are found in various places. This graphic shows how the climate zones compare for various types of plant communities. Because climate change is expected to affect both temperature and precipitation, major shifts in plant communities are projected in the West and elsewhere. Here's a close-up of the United States showing the average temperature from 1951 to 2006. You can see that the West has some of the coldest and hottest areas, sometimes in close proximity to one another. Now let's look at precipitation. You can see that west of the 100th meridian, conditions are generally drier, except for the Pacific Northwest and the highest mountains in the region. But what's perhaps most striking about the West is how varied the precipitation is and how spotty the patterns are largely due to the influence of mountains and the rain shadows they cast. Let's talk a little bit about biomes. An area's climate more or less determines what types of plants can grow there. At the broadest level, we can classify the planet's land masses according to the predominant vegetation or lack thereof. There are 16 terrestrial biomes, ranging from snow and tundra to tropical forests. Here's a close-up of the U.S. Much of the interior west is dominated by desert and xeric or dry shrublands, but the higher elevations support temperate conifer forests. California has Mediterranean forests along much of its coast and the Sierra foothills. There's a bit of subtropical forest in the mountains of southeast Arizona and temperate broadleaf forest in Oregon's coastal range. 
As with temperature, rainfall, and elevation, there is more uniformity in the east than the west. Look, for example, at how many different types of communities are found in California, or how isolated mountains in the Great Basin create little biome islands. The U.S. leads the world in the number of biomes and smaller ecoregions within its borders, even exceeding countries that are much larger in size. So it's no surprise that the U.S. also ranks high in species diversity. In this graphic, the blue bars show the number of species that are found in the U.S. broken down by species type and the orange diamonds show what percent of the world's species are found in the US and the number in parentheses in the labels on the horizontal axis indicate the US ranking worldwide. The highest levels of diversity for several species groups are found in the US including freshwater mussels, freshwater snails, and crayfish. Several other taxonomic groups such as freshwater fishes and gymnosperms are also well represented in the US. Let's take a closer look at ecoregions, which are a helpful unit of analysis for examining the incredible diversity of species and ecosystems that inhabit the world and the West. A more fine-grained view than biomes classifies the terrestrial world into 825 unique ecoregions. These areas are sort of like ecological neighborhoods with similar habitat. The slides that follow are based on the Nature Conservancy's Atlas of Global Conservation, which analyzes the global environment using terrestrial and freshwater ecoregions. Here's a close-up of the West. If you were to drive through several ecoregions, say on an interstate road trip, you'd notice the differences simply by looking out the window. The Nature Conservancy's atlas also analyzes the Earth according to its 426 freshwater ecoregions. Each of these regions has a unique collection of fish species and other aquatic species, as well as freshwater habitats. This close-up of the West shows its two dozen or so freshwater ecoregions. The geographic definitions don't always line up with the boundaries of river basins. The Colorado River Basin, for example, includes the Colorado, Bonneville, Vegas Virgin, and Gila freshwater ecoregions. One way to summarize biodiversity is to look at the evolutionary distinctiveness of species in a given location. This map shows the phylogenetic diversity of terrestrial vertebrates, animals with a backbone. Phylogenetics is a measure of how closely related a group of species is. An ecoregion with high phylogenetic diversity has species that are more distinct from one another. The measure is actually calculated by using something called a cladogram, which is what most people know as the tree of life, a diagram that shows how species have branched out due to evolution. Phylogenetics takes measurements in the cladogram to calculate the evolutionary distinctiveness of species, which is greatest around the tropics. In the west, phylogenetic diversity of vertebrates tends to be highest in the desert southwest. In general, measures of species diversity are greater at lower latitudes due to the past effects of ice age glaciation at higher latitudes and the configuration of landforms on the earth, both past and present. Another high-level measure of biodiversity is the number of species that are found in one area but no other place on earth, what's known as endemism. This map shows the number of endemic vertebrates by terrestrial ecoregion. Endemic species of birds, mammals, and reptiles have typically evolved in isolated habitats, such as islands. Endemism tends to be greatest in the tropics and in places with many islands. In the U.S., the number of endemic vertebrate species is highest in the southwest and Gulf Coast states. Even arid areas have islands of isolated habitat, such as mountaintop forests surrounded by deserts, that can give rise to endemism. In the U.S., freshwater endemism is greatest in Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia. Out west, hotspots include California, Oregon, Utah, and Arizona. In the U.S., the southwest, the foothills around California's Central Valley, and the southeast and Appalachians 
have the most threatened animals. Let's take a closer look at certain types of species. This map shows the number of plants by terrestrial ecoregion. Worldwide, there are more than 420,000 of the so-called higher order plants, trees, vines, grasses, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. Deserts and arid lands typically have fewer plant species, while tropical rainforests have the most. But in North America, some drier parts of the inland west actually have more plant species than wetter climes along the coast. Compare, for example, the Great Basin in Nevada to Washington State. For mammals, the greatest number of species is in the inland west, and highest in the archipelago of Sky Island mountain ranges in southeast Arizona and southwest New Mexico, plus some higher elevation areas in west Texas. In the U.S., most areas have between four and eight freshwater mammal species, but there are upwards of 20 in the Pacific Northwest, parts of the Midwest, and along the eastern seaboard. With birds, the diversity is highest in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, with many tropical and subtropical species at the northern extent of their ranges. For freshwater bird species, Texas has the most, but virtually all parts of the country have at least 60 species. For amphibians, the southeast U.S. has the greatest number of species, and an especially large number of salamanders. There aren't as many amphibians out west, but there are still plenty in places that aren't especially wet, such as the Colorado Plateau and Mojave Desert. Many amphibians around the world are threatened. In the U.S., Texas has the most. There are three to seven such species in California, Oregon, and the Four Corners states. As you might expect, the number of lizard and snake species is highest in Arizona, New Mexico. There aren't many crocodiles outside of Florida, but even in drier areas such as the southwest and northern plains, there are plenty of turtles. In the U.S., ecoregions around the Mississippi and its tributaries harbor many freshwater fish species, in some cases five times as many as in western ecoregions. There are more than a dozen migratory fish species found in the Pacific Northwest and many parts of the East, but such species are relatively rare in the Great Basin in Arizona. There are nearly 80,000 dams in the United States, and virtually all ecoregions have seen their fish runs significantly disrupted. In the West, the problem is especially bad along the Columbia and Colorado rivers, both of which have major hydroelectric dams. Virtually all of the country also has at least some harmful invasive species, with the greatest number found around the Great Lakes and Northeast. Invasive species are an especially big problem in Europe and the United States. This graphic shows that the number of invaders reported on the European coast and in marine waters of North America has been steadily increasing. Now let's turn to species diversity one of the key metrics used to analyze biodiversity. For starters, nobody really knows just how many species there are in the world. Biologists have described fewer than two million species, but they know that many, many more exist, especially among insects. This graphic shows the breakdown of named species. Well-known species, such as birds and mammals, aren't so numerous compared to insects, plants, and arachnids. We know from the fossil record that more than 99% of the species that have ever inhabited the planet are gone forever. Scientists have identified five mass extinction events in the Earth's history the most recent occurring about 65.5 million years ago when an asteroid struck near the Yucatan Peninsula and three-quarters of the planet's species died out. Many researchers believe we are in the early days of the Earth's sixth great extinction event, with some scientists predicting that one-third or more of all species will be gone or doomed by the end of the 21st century if emissions of heat-trapping greenhouse gases continue to increase. This graphic shows how the number of genera, 
plural for genus, has changed over the past 542 million years. Scientists believe the current rate of extinction may be up to 1,000 times faster than the pace that prevailed before humans entered the scene. This graphic shows that the rate of future extinctions may increase further due to climate change and other threats. On the global level, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, has evaluated more than 61,000 of the Earth's species. That's just a fraction of the total named species, and an even smaller share of the total number of species. The status of nearly 10,000 of those species is still unknown because of a lack of data. Almost half are in the least concerned category, but nearly 1,000 species have already gone extinct in the wild, and nearly 20,000 species are classified in one of the three threatened categories, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. Here's the breakdown for the U.S. Researchers believe that there are at least 200,000 U.S. species, but they have only evaluated about 5,000 of them, and half of those are considered data to vision. The IUCN classifies 269 species as extinct or extinct in the wild, and places nearly 1,200 in the three threatened categories. IUCN has been making progress in evaluating species, with more than three times as many assessed today compared to a decade ago. As a result, the number of recognized threatened species has also been increasing, and now approaches 20,000, or about one-third of the total. The number of species on the IUCN's red list of threatened species has increased from about 10,000 in the mid-1990s to nearly 20,000 today, with many of the new additions classified as critically endangered. It's important to note that IUCN assessments have focused on certain types of species. The IUCN has classified virtually all birds, mammals, and amphibians, but with many other taxa, including the insects and plants that make up the lion's share of species, the IUCN has assessed hardly any of them. So how are U.S. species doing? This graphic uses a slightly different categorization, the Natural Heritage Ranking, and shows what percent of species fall into the most threatened categories. Nationally, freshwater mussels, crayfish, stoneflies, and fish are the most at risk, while mammals and birds are the least at risk. Overall, about 30% of plants and animals in the U.S. are considered vulnerable or worse, according to this ranking system used by the Nature Conservancy and state governments. Now let's turn to a subset of imperiled species, the plants and animals that have received protection under the Endangered Species Act, or ESA. There are more than 1,200 endangered species in the U.S., but a small subset tends to generate the lion's share of attention. Here are some of the notable endangered species in the West, where they're found, and how they figured into public policy debates. Although species protected by the ESA sometimes do have significant economic and regulatory impacts, most of the plants and animals protected by the law are not lightning rods for controversy. This chart shows how many species have been listed as threatened or endangered on a cumulative basis. Although the ESA was enacted in 1973, some species were listed under a precursor to the law in the late 1960s. Species are supposed to be added to the endangered list solely on the basis of biology and whether they're endangered, regardless of their economic impact, but many studies of the act have found that politics frequently intrudes into the listing process. If you overlay the terms of the U.S. presidents, you can see that listings really leveled off during the second Bush administration. Here's another look at the same data. This graphic shows how many species were listed as threatened or endangered each year. That sharp decline around 1995 is due to a moratorium on new listings that was enacted by Congress after the Republican Revolution of 1994. 
This graphic shows how many species each president listed under the ESA, on average, per year in office. Environmentalists had a tough time getting species listed during George W. Bush's two terms, but the rate under Ken Salazar's Interior Department is less than half the rate when Bruce Babbitt was in charge of Interior during the Clinton administration. Many species that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has judged at risk of extinction are not receiving protection from the ESA. Nearly 250 species have been declared as candidates, meaning their listing is biologically warranted but precluded by budgetary constraints. This list is akin to the queue waiting to board Noah's Ark and has been the subject of some recent litigation. Hawaii, the Pacific Coast, the Southwest, Appalachia and Florida tend to have the most candidate species. This map analyzes endangered species by counties. You can see that there is often considerable variation within single states, like California or Nevada, where one county may have more than 10 listed species, while an adjoining county may have none. Hawaii, the Pacific Coast, the Southwest, Appalachia, and Florida stand out for their large number of listed species, but many U.S. counties, especially in the Midwest, have no threatened or endangered species at all. Here's another look at the same data using equal area hexagons to depict the hotspots, which avoids the problem of large counties overshadowing smaller ones. The same basic pattern exists. Hotspots for endangered species include Hawaii, the Pacific Coast, Southwest, Appalachia, and the Southeast. Another biodiversity measure, the Rarity Weighted Richness Index, combines both biodiversity and the rarity of species. Many of the hotspots are in California, though the southwest also ranks relatively high. Back east, there are hotspots of rarity and richness in Appalachia and Florida. Another way to look at the geography of endangered species is to examine a map of critical habitat, areas that are considered especially important for the recovery of listed plants and animals. These areas are designated under the ESA, and they can face additional regulations, but only some threatened and endangered species have critical habitat mapped. You can see from this map that a handful of species, such as the spotted owls, desert tortoise, greater sage grouse, and Canada lynx, account for much of the critical habitat in the west. Most of the fish critical habitat is for salmon and trout. On public lands, the greatest number of federally listed and imperiled species is found in national forests. But military lands, many of them located in the West, actually have a greater share of imperiled and endangered species than our national parks or our national wildlife refuges. This graphic shows the composition of U.S. threatened and endangered species. More than half of them are plants, which receive less protection under the law. Although insects make up the bulk of species that we know about, very few are protected by the ESA. Why are species at risk? This analysis looked at a broader category, species listed under the ESA and those classified as imperiled, and it analyzed why they were in jeopardy. Habitat loss and degradation are the biggest threats, followed by alien species. There are some differences depending on the type of species. Reptiles, for instance, are subject to overexploitation because of a brisk black market, while birds are subject to diseases like avian malaria and West Nile virus. Here's another look at threats to endangered species. This graphic shows the share of federal endangered, threatened, and proposed species that have been harmed by various types of habitat loss and degradation. We've talked about a couple of different classification schemes thus far, so how does something like the IUCN Red List match up against the list of species protected by the ESA? This graphic shows that about 80% of U.S. endangered species are considered imperiled or worse by the IUCN. Now for both endangered and threatened species, nearly all are considered vulnerable or worse.
But there are some interesting differences across the species. The three bars on the right show that about half of listed vertebrates are critically imperiled or worse, but about 70% of listed plants and more than 80% of listed invertebrates are considered critically imperiled or worse. This suggests that plants and invertebrates have to be in worse shape before they are listed, perhaps because these species tend to be less charismatic. We've talked about how species get added to the list, but what about delistings under the ESA? This hasn't happened very often since 1973, less than 50 times. In 20 cases, a species was declared recovered and no longer in need of ESA protection. 18 times, the government decided that the original listing was in error, often because of taxonomic changes or the discovery of new populations. In nine cases, a species protected by the ESA has been declared extinct. So at a high level, this graphic summarizes the performance of the ESA. Hardly any species that have received federal protection have gone extinct, but less than 2% of listed species have recovered sufficiently so they could be delisted. It's important to remember that plenty of U.S. species went extinct long before the ESA was enacted in 1973. This graphic summarizes what we know about species that have gone extinct or are possibly gone for good. Insects, plants, and snails lead the list, but there are virtually no reptiles, mammals, or amphibians that are classified as presumed or possibly extinct. This map shows where extinctions are thought to have taken place. Hawaii with 249 is off the charts and followed by Alabama with 96 and California with 35. Here are some examples of species once found in the West that are now considered extinct. The photos shown here are of closely related subspecies or stuffed animals. Because these species are extinct, obtaining actual images of the plants and animals is no longer possible. Let's review some of the main points from this presentation. Ecosystem and species diversity is one of the hallmarks of the American West. This is due to the region's extremes in elevation, wide variation in climate, and unique assemblage of ecological communities. Within this mosaic of ecoregions, the West harbors some of the nation's hotspots for biological diversity. Around the world, scientists believe we are losing species at a rate that far exceeds the natural ebb and flow. Habitat loss and invasive species are among the greatest threats, but overhunting and illegal collecting are less of a problem today. Climate change is expected to significantly increase the rate of extinction and loss of biological diversity in the West and around the globe. But we actually know very little about most species, with our attention focused mostly on mammals, birds, and other charismatic life forms. Thanks for watching this presentation. You can download it, as well as other slides and entire libraries, at ecowest.org. A number of leading experts on Western conservation serve as advisors to EcoWest. EcoWest is produced by California Environmental Associates. Please feel free to contact us if you have a question or want to make a suggestion.